ask Mr. Jim Nail to get us started this evening. Evening, Mayor, Council Members. Um, tonight we have a presentation here on a repair project for our H5 turbine. Uh, again, the, the H5 unit is one of our gas-powered units. It's located at the substation there at Salisbury in 291. Uh, and IPL staff, we recommend approval of a purchase order to General Electric to inspect and repair that turbine section of the combustion turbine. Um, I don't have, uh, we don't have a purchase order to uh, ask for approval yet. That'll be at your December 5th council meeting. Uh, I couldn't get a quote in time to meet the two Friday publication deadline. So we'll, uh, we'll be reviewing this then on the December 5th meeting for you. But, um, just as a reminder, our um, H5 turbine is a gas, it's gas powered uh, combustion turbine, about 17 megawatts. It's one of our two gas fired turbines, the other four being uh, fueled by diesel. And this is one of our units that's most frequently called on by Southwest Power Pool. Um, we have an unknown vibration in the turbine section. Uh, we can start the unit up, but when you get to full speed and, and actually energize the generator, the vibration ramps up to where it trips the unit off. Uh, we've been working closely with General Electric. They've been excellent partners with us, uh, looking at every, every inspection that we could do ourselves and even with their assistance. Uh, we've not been able to find the source of the vibration yet other than to know that it's in the turbine end. Um, so they have, um, they have got a proposal to us to repair the unit, to return it to service, and over the next couple of days, we'll be finalizing that proposal with them and then present it to you in the December 5th council meeting. Uh, just as some review, uh, last year we had the generator fault. The picture you see there is the, the generator section of that turbine generator. Um, it had to be sent off to a GE facility to find out where the fault was. It ended up, it was in the copper windings and that had to be, that had to be redone. Um, unfortunately, the delays in deciding to repair it and the delays then in getting on GE's schedule, we ran into supply chain issues trying to source the copper. Uh, by the time we got the unit back from GE, it had been sitting there idle for uh, just over a year. Um, with, with GE's assistance, putting the unit back together and preparing it to uh, test out, that's when we discovered the, the uh, vibration. Uh, here's a picture of the compressor and tur the turbine section of the, of the uh, unit. It's pretty good size, lots of metal there. Uh, unfortunately, when metal sits for a long time like that, metal sags, bearings deform. Um, again, we've, we've tried all the local things we can do to try to identify that source. Those blades that you see in that picture, they're enclosed by a shroud that has very, very tight tolerances. So just a little bit of shift. Uh, can end up with a rub in that turbine housing, and uh, that's what we'll be asking GE to uh, disassemble and uh, come up with um, a repair. Now, there is a change to this. Uh, at, originally, we thought if we're going to tear this whole thing apart and spend a million plus dollars on, do, why don't we go ahead and do the next major inspection? That's due in 27. However, with it by the time this thing gets back in operation, it'll have been idle for almost two years, and we can push that major inspection out uh, further. So there, we really think we can, we can go ahead and, and we'll have GE give us a, a quote that does not include that major inspection. Um, last year when they were here, they did provide some insight on the nature of these turbines, how robust they are, and the life expectancy. Uh, to help justify why we would consider repairing it, um, even though it's 40 years old. GE has what they call a life, inspect, a life extension inspection, and they target units that have had 5,000 startups and over 200,000 operating hours. For comparison, this unit had 2,825 starts, so a little over half of what they would consider a, a end of life, and only 23,654 hours, so just over 10% of what they, the threshold they would use for operating life. Um, 
Approximately 3,000 frame five and frame three GE turbines are still in operation today. And about 60% of all the frame fives ever built are still in operation today. So these are robust workhorses. Uh, they're not as efficient as new technology, but they get the job done and they're built, they're built rugged and tough. And based on GE's assessment, we still have economic life left in this unit and uh, that supports our assessment of going ahead with the repair. Um, now, there have been questions, when do we stop putting money into this unit? Well, in this case, we spent, the quote last year was about 1.9 million. The repair actually came in under 1.3. Uh, this quote will be in the ballpark of about 1.8 also, uh, but we're hoping that the inspection uh, goes our way and, and we end up spending less. But even, even worst case, you're still looking at uh, three to three and a half million dollars for the two repairs combined. At 17 megawatts of capacity, that's less than $250,000 per megawatt. You can't buy capacity that cheap. So this is, this is a reasonable investment for us to keep the capacity of that unit available to us uh, to meet our obligations. Um, and we'll go into a few other issues as well as we go through this. Where does this unit fit into our, our business? Well, it's been, we've been told one of the issues about IPL is we only generate 2% of our power anymore. Well, what we do is we fill a niche within Southwest Power Pool that is desperately needed across all the different regional operating groups in the country. Um, this, this chart here, the black line shows the wind and you can see over a 48 hour period, it follows a pretty, pretty stable or a pretty normal condition, drops off in the early morning, comes back up late in the afternoon, overnight it drops off again. And that's, that's a, a very normal curve for our wind patterns. What that does to our power prices is anytime the wind dips, it causes the power prices to spike. The blue line is the volatility that you see in our hourly pricing. Steam plants, whether that's Dogwood, Iotan, Nebraska City, our old Blue Valley boilers, they have a hard time operating in that type of a scenario. You need a boiler, our boilers took 12 hours to bring from, to light them off and then get them up to operating condition. Once you get there, you don't want to be dropping back off again. You don't want to run for a couple of hours and start and shut down. Boilers need to run for a long time. Because of the preferential pricing for wind, boilers have to, they have to be able to flex like that. And we've seen situations now where Dogwood, Iotan, Nebraska City have chosen not to run if they don't know that, if they don't have reasonable assurance they're gonna run for a good long period, they'll choose not to run. Um, so something has to be ready to come online when the wind drops off. That's where, I, like our combustion turbines, uh, recip engines, that's where those kind of kind of units uh, come into play. And where you'll see across the country, utilities are investing in putting these units in to support their wind and solar build outs. Renewable resources, they do account for a growing share of Southwest Power Pool capacity. If you go to Southwest Power Pool's website, you'll see a pie chart that shows how much wind is, is contributing or all the different sources. And it sometimes it's 70, 72, 74%. That's hourly. That is, a, that is a snapshot of what it's doing right then. If you look at the overall, like for the quarter, the third quarter report came out, the largest category of generation in Southwest Power Pool over the third quarter was coal, followed by gas, and wind came in at about 24%. So even, while it has the ability to support in the middle of the afternoon, you may get 72, 74%. Over the long haul, it's about 24%. So the, wind, the, the coal and gas units are very important to providing that reliable power across the, the, the plains 24 seven. Mr. Neal? Yes. Can I ask you a question? Just sure. Since you were going through you know, some of the, the sources of power, I know Texas has nuclear as well, but, but they don't draw much from them because they don't run much. Is that is that right? Is it like 9% of the total SPP is generated through nuclear? 
Well, I know we have, we have a handful of, of nuclear plants within the Southwest Power Pool footprint. You've got Wolf Creek, uh, which is about 1,200 megawatts. Uh, there's one up um, in southern Nebraska right across the state line from us. Um, I'm not sure how big that one is, but we have, nu we have nuclear power, and the, the, the nice thing about nuclear power is once they, once they get it up to 100%, they just leave it there for mm -hmm. weeks and weeks at a time. Uh, so it, it provides a, a good support that way. And it's pretty cheap. And once you've built it, mm -hmm. well, operating I'm, it I'm is... I'm talking about yes. it once, once what we're buying or what, what they can produce it for, right? So it, it's competitive. Yeah. Yep, it's competitive. Okay. Um, again, as I said on the last slide, base load units can't compete with, with wind. Uh, they can't do that turn on, turn off cycle. Uh, peaking units uh, fill that gap. Recent recommendations, and this has come from uh, MISO, which is the Mid, Mid America or uh, Midwest Independent System Operator, SPP. They've looked at their long term forecasts, and so much wind and solar have been built without consideration for backup, and so many of the old coal units have been retired. They are now forecasting potential shortfalls of energy on peak load days. In order to combat that, one of the recommendations that's, that's been floated out there now is that any new wind and solar project should be accompanied by 60% equivalent of standby power. They're that serious about reliability and resiliency in the grid. In the, the early days of wind and solar, there was no requirement, so people could build whatever they want, wherever they wanted, and there was no backup um, included with that. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Nail. So if I'm understanding you correctly, and just a simple math question here, if you have 100, 100 uh, megawatts of solar, they would require that that project to also include 60 megawatts of an alternative source that you could basically turn on and turn off. Right. If I'm hearing you correctly. That's correct. Okay, perfect. Now, that, that's, that's a recommendation that's being discussed at, up at the levels of, of FERC, NERC, MISO, SPP, um, but I expect they will end up with, as they continue to look at more and more solar and wind projects, more and more retirements, they're going to have to balance that somehow. And right now, that's the target that's been project or been proposed. So th the bottom line is, as old as they are, our, our combustion turbines do support the grid. Um, just for calendar year 22, those four diesel fueled units have been called on more than 150 times. In fact, tonight, all four have been called on to run for about four hours this, e this evening. That 150 times has generated, after fuel costs, SPP generation credits of almost $750,000. Typically, our H5 and H6 units, because they're gas and gas is cheaper than diesel, typically they will get called on before the, the diesel fueled units, and often they'll get called on in cases where the diesel ones wouldn't. So the projection is that while the diesel units have been run 150 times, our H5 and H6 units would have been run even more had they been available. So in summary, our H5 turbine is a valuable asset. Um, we've, we've repaired the generator in last year. Now we have to look at the turbine end, but that is 17 megawatts of capacity that, that we need to help make our obligation with SBP. Um, this repair will return that productive asset back to operation. Um, it continue, it'll continue to provide internal strength to our system for reliability and resilience. And more importantly, it keeps our options open as we begin to discuss where we go next. If we have that 17 megawatts available to support us, then that's 17 that we don't have to replace right away and opens up more options that we can discuss with you in the months to come. Subject to your questions, that's our report. Mr. Mayor. Any questions? Mr. Proceed. Mayor. <clears throat> Mr. Nail, uh, I believe I know this answer, but uh, authorizing this repair on H5 uh, fits the business case. We. It's in sp specifically this one and the other gas one. Don't they make? They generate more than they cost typically every year. Is that right? 
Are they revenue positive? Is that a way to say it? I'd have to take a look at what the all-in costs are, but as far as we, we do generate, we do generate credits uh, in excess of our fuel costs, which then go to reduce how much we have to purchase from Southwest Power Pool. I know you have a bright young uh, assistant director out there that's dying to become a business case expert for IPL. We may need that uh, increasingly in the coming months. Well, and to partially answer your question, we have an obligation to provide 112% of our peak load in available capacity. SPP has increased that to 115%. So the margin we had has shrunk. Without, if we don't, if we choose not to repair H5, that's gonna put us about one megawatt below that threshold. Now, depending on how we, when we, when we analyze our uh, load for 22, uh, and whether we can shave a megawatt off of that and, and be okay. But uh, again, that 17 megawatts is valuable. Right now, uh, when we put this presentation together six months ago, capacity, that 17 megawatts of capacity to replace would cost us approximately $500,000 a year. We know that market capacity has gone up 30% in the last quarter. Uh, so costs are rising. If we went on the open, that, and that 500,000, that was with our existing contract with Oneta. So we could, we could tap into our, we've got 25 megawatts available through Oneta, cost us about 500,000 a year to replace the 17. If we went on the open market for capacity, six months ago, that was about $600,000 a year. So if this unit, if this unit runs and like I said, the H5, the, the gas, or the, the diesel units generated almost $750,000 of cost or credit over fuel costs just in this calendar year, which isn't over yet. If you said this unit would do $500,000 a year, in four years you've paid for this repair. In that same four years, you would have spent $500,000, $600,000 with no generation credit. So. The, there is, a, there is an important offset there that these units bring with them. Anyone else, other questions? Mr. Mayor. Please proceed. Um, Mr. Nell, um, I'm gonna use a Navy term, I'm sure that they'll understand this. The scuttlebutt is on diesel, <laughs> is that it's, it's becoming um, short supplied. Are we gonna see anything, um, or are we concerned about some of the diesel supplies that uh, that we depend on? Right now, we're not seeing a problem with deliveries. We are seeing the same news reports that the yeah. diesel is getting, uh, because production is being favored towards gasoline and yeah. other uses, that diesel's coming up uh, second. Uh, the costs are going up, okay. but we're watching that, and especially for the winter, we've, since, since the winter storm um, in 21, we've, we've increased our winter uh, storage levels to make sure we, we uh, capitalize on, if we see a good deal, we'll order extra and get more in the tank. But as, as the price goes up, we have the option of raising our entry price for those units with Southwest Power Pool so that we recover those extra okay. costs. Okay, and, and so you'll just keep us abreast if, if we see a big spike. Certainly, yes sir. So we can let our rate payers know what could be coming if, if not. Um, just to let you know, I, I failed Wednesday to honor you and, and the city staff that are veterans. And so last Friday was Veterans Day and I failed to do so. I, I meant to do that Wednesday and failed to do so, but we appreciate your service to this nation, um, your, your staff, your uh, the city staff that have uh, served us and have been brought your expertise and, and your professionalism to our city. We, we just want to honor you in that. So I just want to say thank you. For well, thank you, sir. I can say I had the time of my life doing it. So thank you all for allowing me that opportunity. Wow. And thank you for the article that you sent me or the, on the nuclear. I like to say nuclear. So I, I would love to have a serious discussion one day on the future, because I think it's, Certainly. It's, it's part of what we could be. So, but thank you. Anyone else other questions? Just real briefly, Mr. Go ahead. Uh, Mr. Nell, just real quick.
quickly make sure I'm understanding. If um, if we were to undertake this repair project, is there any chance that the repair that was previously made caused this issue or could be connected to this issue and you know end up being that it wasn't really our fault that it, it happened or not to get too technical but it there is there is a possibility that when they rewound the generator it shifted the electrical center the electromagnetic center of that rotor which when you start it up it seeks to find that center and if it pushed if it pushed just a little bit one direction um, but we can adjust for that um, when when we do all that testing um, don't know that that's uh, an issue but uh, that certainly is is one possibility. So if that was to happen, then would GE repair it for free? Or, I mean, how does that work? I'm sure that's something we'd have to discuss with them. I'm sure um, you would. <laughs> the, likely they would not consider that their fault, um, depending on how those, how those windings all went back I that was probably together. the case. I just thought I'd ask. I, I think, uh, excuse me, Mr. Mayor, on behalf of the council, I think you're free to tell GE they'll fix their problem and they'll like it. <laughs> I think we're all on board with that. Uh, Mr. Neal, if I can ask you, so again, and you may have said it earlier, what's the rough cost for the whole thing to repair this? Is, and I realize they haven't got the proposal and you haven't got the bids, but, you know, ballpark. And I won't hold you to it. Ballpark, about 1.8. Uh, but that includes uh, estimations for repair parts that may not be needed. Um, so it could be high. Could be higher, could be lower. Okay. Um, and then, you know, if we're going to make a, a bet on this, what's the probability of success? Would they guarantee us if we spent that $1.8 million that it would in fact work when we got it back? The, the vibration, uh, it, it's noticeable but faint when you first start rolling the turbine. It really ramps up when it gets to full speed. Um, that doesn't sound like a, a catastrophic error, uh, but more like if a rub somewhere in the turbine housing, uh, we just have to take it apart to be able to find it. Um, they would be able, they should be able to machine that into, into specs. Uh, so the chances of success are high. So I don't mean to be difficult. I'm not trying to be, I'm not gonna hold you this, but are we looking at 80, 90, 70%? success rate, what do you think? And I, and I won't hold you to it, but I'm just trying to, you know, if we're gonna make a bet of 1.8 million with the taxpayer's money, excuse me, the ratepayer's money, I wanna make pretty sure that we've got a really, really high probability of success. I'd be confident that it's 90 plus. Okay. Okay, that's all my questions, thank you. Anyone else? Appreciate your time, Mr. Nail. Certainly. It's something I'll be, when it comes up, I'll be voting to approve it, just okay. FYI. Very good, thank you. Um, Mr. City Manager, uh, anything else uh, on the agenda tonight? Or? Yes, we do have one other presentation this evening. Okay. Um, oftentimes, and particularly it does follow um, a council election, we are asked as staff just to help give an overview of what the roles and responsibilities of an elected official and municipal government is. Uh, and looking at some of our old study session agendas, I can't tell exactly where um, that has ever been formally presented to the council. So tonight, um, Joe Lauber from Lauber Municipal Law, who of course is the attorney of record for the city, uh, Joe travels statewide and gives this presentation. We've asked him to truncate this down for you tonight, but to give you um, a flavor of what the, the roles and responsibilities of both council and staff are in a, um, the form of government that we operate under. So without further ado, I'll turn over to, to Mr. Lauber. Okay, thank you, Mr. Lauber. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, uh, Pleasure to be here this evening. Uh, for those of you who, who uh, don't know me, uh, I, I founded Lauber Municipal Law in, in 2010. Uh, Jeremy Cover, who I'm sure you're familiar with, uh, it, uh, has been with me since uh, 2015. Um, we represent 70 cities as city attorney throughout the state of Missouri. I've been doing this for about 20 years uh, and uh, have the opportunity to kind of speak not only statewide but nationally. Uh, and internationally on, on matters of, of municipal law. Uh, and so this evening, uh, I'm here to, to work with you on a, on a program that we developed uh, over the summer. Uh, one of our other clients had asked for a, a program like this and uh, uh, several of our other clients have, have actually uh, asked us to present this program as well. And it's designed to kind of help 
um, help councils, uh, members of council, uh, uh, you know, have hear uh, kind of the roles uh, and how the roles uh, divide out at uh, at City Hall amongst the the separations of power, essentially, you know, for the administrative branch, the exec, uh, the uh, judicial branch, and and the legislative branch. Uh, so we'll be uh, talking about uh, those issues this evening. Um, a lot of times, I, I, you know, like to kind of point out is, you know, many of you, uh, when you've decided to run for office, you may have gone to meetings, but you know, it's, it's pretty rare, I think, that that you actually receive any, you know, real training uh, when the time comes to kind of, you know, uh, 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 understand those roles. And so, again, this is designed to kind of assist with uh, with some of that. So I'm pretty old school, so I've got some paper up here. I'm going to try to uh, flip through this as well as we go. Okay. So uh, as uh, Mr. Walker had pointed out, um, this is normally about a two-hour presentation, so we kind of tried to you know, cram it down into just about 60 minutes for you this evening. Uh, so there are a few areas that we, we kind of uh, have skipped, um, and I'll try to just lightly uh, touch those uh, as we go, but um, uh, where they're needed. So initially, uh, you know, things that, that you already know just from Article 2 of, of your charter, and, and again, you are a charter city. Uh, not all cities in Missouri are charter cities. You, there are other types. Uh, if you go to MML events, you may run into those other types of cities that are out there. So with your charter kind of forming your government, it's kind of like your little mini constitution, if you will. You create your council of seven members, which includes the mayor, uh, two council members at large, and four that represent four individual districts uh, throughout the city. Um, in chapter, uh, in section uh, 2.1 of your charter, uh, that lays out uh, the, cert the powers of the council. Uh, some, but not all of, uh, of those, uh, include you know examples of, of enacting municipal legislation uh, relating to any or all subjects or matters within the powers of the city. Section uh, 1.3 of your charter addresses what authority a, a charter city has, and in in kind of uh, in, in short form, essentially charter cities in Missouri have all of the powers that the General Assembly could have give, or has given them or could have given them. Uh, and so it is a, a broad brush of power. I have several uh, clients right now that are fourth class cities that are actually considering, you know, making their move to charter. Uh, and your charter has been in place for uh, 61 years, I believe, if I, if I did my math correctly on that. Um, one of the, the slides that we cut out kind of does talk about the fact that at the local level, we have separation of powers just like we have at the federal and state levels. We typically have, you know, at the, at the federal level, we have our president is the, is the chief executive officer of, of the government. We have uh, uh, the, uh, we have the uh, Congress, which is the legislative branch, and we have the Supreme Court, which is our judicial branch. For the city of independence, <laughs> Your, uh, where we would normally, with maybe some other types of cities or even other home rule cities that have adopted more of what I would call like a fourth class or a third class city form of, of government, we typically would see the mayor as the chief executive officer, the council members as the legislators, and then of course your municipal courts uh, serve as your judicial. Here in, in Independence, the way you have set it up, you've adopted the city manager form of government, and so that makes our mayor a member of, of the legislative body, uh, more so, and the city manager is the chief executive officer of, of the city under under the forms that you've you've come up with uh, uh, through your charter. So, again, municipal legislation, adopting budgets, uh, providing revenues, making a re appropriations, uh, kind of you know, legislators cover the big uh, the big picture direction of the city rather than the day to day. So we talked about legally under your charter what your what your roles as uh, as a city council is, but from a practical standpoint, the things that that kind of maybe are just common sense are that you represent the people, you represent your constituents, uh, the the folks who voted you into office. Um, your your job as council members are to develop and evaluate policies and programs. So again, as as legislators, as as the policy makers, you're providing the direction. 
Uh, your responsibility is to maintain fiscal integrity, to make sure that uh, fiscally the city is, is staying strong and, and we have good uh, procedures and policies in place uh, to keep it going in that direction. You determine what services we provide. As municipal corporations, we don't make widgets, we do a few here or there, but for the most part, what we do is we provide services to the public that it only makes sense that government would provide. And you know what I'm saying is, is, could you imagine a world where when your house is on fire, the only way that the fire gets put out is if you have enough money to pay for the fire department to come and do that? It doesn't make any sense, okay? Same thing with the police department, you know, uh, and so forth. Uh, fixing the potholes, you could only pay to fix the potholes in front of your house, then, uh, you know, everyone else, uh, it falls apart. Uh, as, a, as a council, uh, the responsibility also is to ensure accountability and transparency. When it comes to uh, the role of council members, it's important to note that individual council members have little to no power. There's a reason that we have quorums, right? Uh, you know, this evening we, we waited for just a moment to make sure we had four of us here because in, you know, even in a group of three of you with a seven member council, you do not have the authority to act and you don't have the authority to act as one or even two. And it's so important that, you know, the way our structure of government has been put together is that you work together as a, sorry, uh, you work together as a team to ensure that there's a, a nice balance of, of power uh, that is, is uh, given uh, or is, is utilized when, when we make decisions and, and not have them work, you know, just in individual uh, roles. And so it, it plays then that ultimately it's the council as a whole, or at least, a, at least in, in most cases, a quorum of the council, of a, a majority of a quorum of the council as a whole that holds the power. So back to kind of the legal uh, requirements, uh, looking to uh, city charter section 2.5, and that is where we, we see the, the, the role of mayor explained legally. Uh, so uh, the mayor, while still a council member under our structure, is, is, a, is the recognized head of the city government for all legal and ceremonial purposes. And again, this is language taken straight from your charter at 2.5. Uh, the mayor presides at the city council meeting, so uh, we, you know, we look to the, the chairperson of the meeting to, con, you know, to control the, the flow of the meeting and uh, you know, to maintain the decorum. The mayor has all rights and privileges and responsibilities of a, of a council member, though, as, we, as I explained earlier. There is no veto power for our mayor. Other mayors in other forms of government in, in the state actually do have that power. Uh, yes, sir. <laughs> Um, could we, in rewriting the charter, give the mayor the ability to veto items? Yes, you would have that authority. It Thank would you. require That's all I need. a charter I, amendment. A simple yes, yes is good. Thank it's you, my friend. It's a very difficult process, but yes. Uh, the mayor has the, declare, the authority to de declare the existence of an emergency in the city, may suspend the hours of business, close certain businesses, take uh, action to preserve the peace, property, safety of citizens. Some of that stuff uh, kind of, you know, is glossed over in, in many times, but a couple years ago, some of that stuff, you know, really kind of came home to roost uh, for us. And we had, you know, I spent a lot of time on the phone with mayors, you know, talking about emergency powers and, and, and you know, what to do about them. Can I ask a question? Yes, sir. Um, on, Mayor, on, is it okay if I, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, so I'm just sorry. sorry. Yep. Um, um, on the, the um, emergency powers, in our city, um, and I think I asked Jeremy to look at this, and he and he. I don't, I'm sure he. Ever, I'm not sure he, he responded back. But there's in our emergency powers. I I'm challenged by some of it as not lining up with like the Second Amendment, um, because we can we can stop ammunition sales, gasoline sales, all of that. And I and I asked him about that, and and I didn't know if that. If the, those have to be in line with the Missouri Constitution as well as the U.S. Constitution as well. If those are things yeah, that that's correct. So as far as like specifically, I didn't look, you know, I didn't do a deep dive necessarily into that. So I, I don't. 
it's I, number I, six. I couldn't, couldn't answer, <laughs> you know, that. that. But I, I understand, yeah. but I, like I said, I, I, I don't know enough about exactly what that provision would entail. But yes, I mean, generally what I would say is that, you know, when we have a charter, that the charter has to remain consistent with the state constitution and the federal constitution. Uh, under our charter, a uh, mayor uh, appoints municipal judges, and there's a process in your Article 4 uh, that, that addresses that. So, you know, as we, as we did with the, the, the council and the legislative side, the, you know, mayor, again, is a member of council. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, with this, um, there's going to be some give and take between the mayor's role and, and the city manager's role. But you know, typically, what we would say is council members should you know confer with the mayor routinely to discuss ideas and, and, and concerns. The mayor should work closely with the city manager to move uh, council goals forward, uh, to anticipate issues on the horizon, and help manage the action of the council meetings. Um, and you know, make sure that the mayor understands council's concerns and, and provides that feedback uh, to uh, to the city manager. So. Um, I use this slide in particular uh, just because it's, to me, it's, it's a good example of, of what, we should, what we should strive for as members of council. Uh, but I also note that it is not even something that comes from, uh, you know, a, a United States uh, governmental entity. Um, so it's, you know, it's really intended to be something that's very general in nature. So, uh, you know, uh, so, you know, what we should strive for uh, as, as members of council would be to conduct yourself in an ethical and respectful manner at all times. To act in a manner consistent with effective and responsible governing of the municipality in a transparent and accountable manner. To set and clearly articulate strategic goals and objectives for the municipality based on consult consultation with the city staff where applicable members of the broader community. To render decisions regarding matters of, of service level delivery and corporate policy based on consultation with city staff and where applicable members of the broader community. To respond to concerns from the public and where appropriate, refer those concerns to city staff um, uh, through the, the mayor or chief administrative officer for action. To only give direction through, to city staff through the resolution by council as a whole. Uh, to op be open to discussion with and seek clarification from city staff as required, and to be respectful of the role of city staff pertaining to their administration or management of the day-to-day -day operations of the municipality. So all things that we should strive for, you know, as, as we, uh, as we uh, proceed as, as council members. Uh, I'm going to move now to the role of the city manager, which is chapter three of your charter. Um, so chapter three provides for that city manager provi uh, uh, position. Council appoints the city manager for an indefinite uh, term by affirmative vote at le of at least five members. So it does require more of a super majority than just a, a, a straight majority uh, of your council uh, to, to appoint the city manager. The city's managers and powers are, uh, are explained in uh, section 3.3 of your charter. Uh, but generally, the city manager shall execute the laws and ordinances and administer the government of the city and shall be responsible there, therefore to the council. So again, as we're talking about the, the various roles, you all set the direction. You set the policy. It's the responsibility of the city staff. The city manager uh, leads that city staff in making sure that your direction is being carried out. Uh, the remainder of, of section 3.3 provides for an express list of the city manager's powers and duties. Um, so some of these duties are to appoint, fire, suspend, demote, or remove directors or heads of administrative departments and all other administrative uh, employees subject to any of your appeals processes that you, that you may have. To supervise admi administrative departments, agencies, officers, of, of the, and employees of the cities, of the city, to administer, prepare, and submit annual budget to the council. Uh, remember, we talked before the council's responsibility is to is to ultimately adopt it when when you uh, find that acceptable, uh, but uh, it's prepared by city staff. Um, to uh, uh, submit to council a complete report on the finances and administrative activities of the city for the preceding year, to advise council on the financial condition and future needs of the city and make recommendations for matters of policy, but again, remember the council's responsibility is to adopt the policy. 
any other powers and duties that the charter provides and the powers and duties consistent uh, with the charter as the council may provide. So essentially there's authority in your, you know, kind of your mini constitution, your charter to then, you know, for you to, uh, to elaborate on, on that through, through ordinance. So what is the practical role of, of city staff? So first of all, to offer professional advice and, uh, I, you know, I say this lightly, but it, 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 it's, it's a point I think that's worth making is keep in mind that each of you, as you are elected, you probably have other vocations, right? You're not doing this for the paycheck. Most, most elected officials aren't doing it for the paycheck. It's usually not that great anyway. Um, you, have, you have a way that you put food on your family's table, how you put your kids through college and so forth. And your city staff, this is their calling in life. They are professionals at providing city services. And so it's important, you know, um, that we, you know, that they offer that professional advice. And it's important as a council that we, you know, we take that counsel uh, from them. Their responsibility is to implement the council's decisions. So again, you all are setting the, the direction, the policy we're saying, this is the direction we need to go for the next five years, 10 years, 25 years, 30 years into the future as we pass the baton to the future elected officials uh, that come behind us. Um, but it's their responsibility to see it carried out. Uh, role of staff is to establish sound administrative practices uh, to maintain the operations of the municipality. Again, they're the ones getting uh, the day-to-day -day work done. I have a story about one of my third class cities that I'm a city attorney for, and I remember one of the very first council member uh, council meetings I went to uh, after uh, uh, one of the new guys came in after being elected, and he was telling all the other council members how he was out on this public works project job, and that has how he had his his arm up this drainage pipe, and he was you know like pulling. I'm like, why, as a council member, are you out there with your arm up any pipe? That is a day-to-day -day work of staff. Your job is to say, we need pipe laid at these streets or we need to adopt a budget. And so, you know, it really matters that we're, we keep ourselves as council members focused on setting the policy and not doing the day-to-day -day work because we have professionals to do that. So let's talk a little bit about just that. So uh, public administration, you know, 101, and I forget the source of this, we borrowed from, from various sources, but you know, essentially this, this, uh, this triangle uh, or pyramid shows at the base we have, uh, have, we have the level one is the work getting done, okay? At the top we have the strategic planning. So you can only imagine, right, whose responsibility is the top of the pyramid? It's the city council. What is the direction? Where are we trying to go? Where do we want to see this city go from now to that five-year mark, that 10-year mark, and, and so forth? And from the strategic planning then goes to the management control. Then, uh, and so for us, that you know, begins to, it's, the, it's the blend between the city council and, and the, the, uh, the head of, of the, the, you know, the chief of staff, if you will, the, the, uh, the uh, city manager in our case. Then you have your operational control, like you know, getting the day-to-day -day work done, and then you have the actual work being done. So what we find is that most city governments in general spend actually very little time in level four. And I, I don't know the reason why. Uh, you know, my observation over 20 years of doing this is I think sometimes the the coming up with the policy and the thinking it through and the visionary, you know, kind of like how do you know how do we see where we are today and how do we where do we want to go into the future? It's hard. It's hard because it it's requires people to think outside the box. Uh, Mr. Mayor, yes. uh, Mr. Lauber, so we have a strategic, I got all excited by your pyramid. Oh. <laughs> we have a strategic planning session scheduled for November 28th. Okay. Uh, sitting behind you is our soon to be finally full and seventh member of our council. Um, uh, there have been some inklings amongst the council that uh, not just should we have the strategic planning session, but perhaps we should follow up on it uh, quarterly. <coughs> Something that, that keeps these high level issues top of mind. Uh, what would you say is a good, good practice for that or what would you recommend or some of your successful clients, what, what do they do with those high level 
top of the pyramid things. Yeah, I, th I think a, a quarterly review can be good. You know, keep in mind, you know, uh, and it, it may be just one of those things, you know, it, it depends a little bit on how far out are we talking on a strategic plan. If you're talking about the strategic plan for 2023, um, you know, yes, yes, quarterly. Okay, if you're talking about a strategic plan for the next five years or the next 10 years, then obviously I think quarterly is probably a, a bit much. Um, but it, that can be an ongoing process, you know, as you go and, and you know, because it takes time. Like, you know, I'm, I'm the city attorney for the city of Sedalia, uh, for example. They're not a charter city. They're a third class city. But they start, you know, their budget review and they, they have each department comes in and speaks and they do about two a night. And we started those about two meetings ago and they're going to go all the way through right, right at the beginning of January uh, on that. And so but, you know, that's something that they do every year. Um, but it is good, you know, like I, I, I'm a big, um, I'm a guy that hates to see a plan, you know, like, and this happens a lot with comprehensive plans, like land use planning, so like that, where you spend, you know, twenty, thirty thousand dollars to create a plan, you get this cool binder and gets presented to you and then it sits on a shelf and nothing happens with it, you know, so if you're going to make plans, you know, I think it is smart to, to, to go back and, and regularly took it, take a look at it. Now, how often you do that would depend on how far out the plan goes, I think. I appreciate that. I, you know, and and just the share of, of frustration and a shortcoming. You know, you work with these folks every day, uh, and even with Mr. Walker, he does an incredible job of of humoring us. But it is hard when you're talking to folks, working on an issue, not to feel that that need to control or micromanage or insert yourself put or put your arm up the drainage pipe. Put right? your arm it's hot I mean it's awfully enticing. Something cool might be in that drainage <laughs> pipe. So that Probably is not. that is a hard thing for uh, for yeah. council members to uh, obviously you see it. So I see it all the time. It, it's a difficult thing because it's so much easier to kind of think about well well, you know, I can do it this way or I think we should do it that way or whatever. You know, in the end you know, I think there, you know, it's worth a conversation, but it's, you know, that conversation is, you know, here's the direction we want to go, you know, Mr. Walker, you know, make it so. Uh, and then if, if there are questions about whether it's being done on time, then, then Mr. Walker needs to answer for that, you know, as we go. But, you know, in the end, you know, Mr. Walker is the professional that, that this city has hired, you know, to make sure that stuff is getting done. And, and that's what you need to rely on him to do that. And, and he will do that for you. Um, so again, uh, most cities spend, you know, most governing bodies spend their time in, in levels two and three, which are the operational and management control, and a lot less time in the, in the actual part that they should be doing, which is, you know, kind of creating that direction. And what ends up happening is, is staff gets frustrated. They get frustrated because it feels like micromanaging, right? It's like, well, you know, like you told us what to do, you know, we're going to do it, you know, and, and we're, you know, we're trained professionals and, and this is what we're recommending. Now, there may be really good reasons, you know, that, that things are, are coming off the rails and maybe you're hearing, you know, uh, uh, feedback from your constituents that needs to be communicated as well because maybe they're not, they're telling you, but they're not telling staff. And that's where we all need to communicate to kind of, you know, because again, what, what's our purpose here, right? You set those goals in that strategic planning session and you're trying to get there. How are we going to get there? And that communication is, is key in, in doing that. Um, uh, decisions may not be being made by the most skilled people uh, in in the in the structure, uh, and sometimes there's no strategy or direction if we're spending you know very little time at the top of the pyramid uh, and more time in the in the middle parts. I apologize, I have lost track of time, so I, I should have I meant to start my thing. So you know, let me know if I'm running over. So. Um, so uh, a similar pyramid here um, uh, talks a, a little bit about, again, the proper role of council. This one is uh, still set up the same way where you've kind of got at the bottom, you've got you know, the, the broad base of work that is being done to carry out the policy. And at the top, you have you know, uh, kind of that, that, um, you know, that, that true kind of theoretical and conceptual uh, 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 planning and, and goal setting. And so your ideal council is always going to be operating at the top. You know, again, you see here, it's another study. This one was actually from uh, uh, the uh, ICMA, um, where most councils operate is kind of, you know, down at that lower level. And, you know, if, if, if you're focusing in on the day-to-day, -day, you're, you're probably missing the point as, as a council member, because that's, you know, essentially where, where bad councils kind of operate. 
this one, uh, to me, I think is, is maybe even the best analogy of them all. And so uh, we'll take a look at that. And so it's the governing body staff kind of flight uh, an analogy. So as we work through the, the, the visual here, we've talked about, you know, that top of the pyramid for you is going to be on the left side of that screen. Okay, so, the, uh, so you've got purpose and vision is when the plane is at 50,000 feet. You can see it all from up there. And if you look, uh, we've got the... Uh, you see where it says uh, on, uh, council responsibility and staff responsibility. So council is green, staff is white on our, on our um, uh, spectrum as we go. So when you've got your purpose and vision at the 50,000 foot mark, uh, you'll see down below, it says, you know, you can see that, that that bar underneath that is almost completely green. And that's because that is a, is, is a strong council uh, uh, area. So at the, at the purpose and vision uh, component of this, at, you know, that 50, you know, that long range planning, that 50,000 feet, you know, the council's role is to affirm the vision, to affirm the purpose, to kind of set that where, and then the staff's role is to support that. But you see that staff's role in that is actually very small. We, you know, the plane starts coming down, we're down at 40,000 feet. Now we're talking about the strategic goals level. And you see, uh, that the, the council's role at that point is, is to establish goals. And again, that bar on that section is still very green. This is the area you know, that council should be operating in. And then uh, you see the staff is starting to have a, a little bit larger area here. And their responsibility at the strategic goals is, is to align the goals with the resources, okay? You wanna increase the budget for roads and you wanna see so many you know, miles of, of roads be improved, then they're gonna start lining up, you know, do they have the public work staff? Do we have the equipment? Do we, you know, where, you know, where are our suppliers and, and that kind of thing? We drop down to 30,000 feet. Now we're setting these priority action items. And you see there that this is almost an even bar between council and staff, but in this circumstance, it's still the council's kind of winning that one out, okay? Uh, so council's responsibility is to establish and prioritize the action items then to carry out the goals that were set previously, and the staff's role is to start to begin to implement those priority items, right? So we can set a goal that says next year we want to do, you know, 100 lane miles of roads or something like that, okay? But, you know, let's pri that's a great goal, right? But then prioritize it. Well, are there certain roads that need more than another? You take feedback from staff. This is what we're seeing out there. This is what you're hearing from your constituents. How do we then, you know, prioritize that and start to, to work through uh, that process? The plane comes down further. We're at 20,000 feet. Now we're talking about planning and oversight of the work that you had set as that policy. And you see, this is the first time now that the council's role is less than, you know, the staff's role at this point because now we're starting to switch from that long-range planning to the budget contract, you know, we're, we're going to that day-to-day -day operation. So here the council's role is to review and adopt a budget, conduct meetings, you know, carry, you know, do that, that piece of, of helping, you know, them be in a position to implement what you're doing. But their job at this point is to prepare plans and oversee functions. Plane drops further. We're talking about individual projects at the 10,000 foot mark. You can see here that the green is, is, you know, disappearing, you know, kind of quickly at this point. Your responsibility is to authorize like the big contracts to carry out the supplies, you know, to get, you know, the equipment that you need to do that. But the staff at that point is now they're planning and they're completing projects for you. And then ultimately we hit the runway. We're, we're on the day-to-day -day work, which is the smallest you know, chunk that the council would be involved with, the largest is for staff. So your responsibility as council members is to engage with your community and your staff to make sure that you know, we're, you know, we're getting that feedback that we need to make sure that we're still on the path and we're knowing you know, where we want to be uh, after this. And staff's responsibility at that point is to carry out those day-to-day -day responsibilities and get the work done. So this is just another way of looking at that pyramid, but I, I really do like this analogy. So uh, talking about uh, establishing what expectations should be. And, and so I'm going to share with you uh, this actually Jeremy's former. Uh, so if you don't know this, Jeremy was an in-house city attorney at the city of Jefferson City for years before I stole him away, from, uh, stole him away from them. So um, they are uh, also a charter city. They're actually more based on like the fourth class form. Uh, they had a mayor back in looks like his signature on here from 04. I think I was working with them back then. Uh, his name was John Landwehr, 
and and uh, Mayor Landwehr was he was an interesting uh, character. He was actually a really good mayor, and and he set rules that he he kind of wanted to see uh, the council and and staff interaction. And so they're 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 kind of funny too. So I like to share these. And we, if you've done our trainings before in the spring, every once in a while you hear like the "don't stump the chump" rule and stuff like that. That's where that comes from is is Mayor Landwehr. So uh, so here. Um, so these are John Landwehr's rules. Council meetings are for final position statements, debate, and voting, not for rolling out novel ideas to, ev to make everyone think you're a stud. If you vote against a measure and lose, briefly state why you disagreed and drop it after 24 hours like it's old news. Don't keep it in your arsenal for two years to justify other actions. If somebody disagrees with you, don't take it personally. Maybe on this issue, you simply had your head up your butt. It happens to all of us once in a while. Even if they, John's words, not mine, Mayor, Mayor Landwehr's words. Even if they deserve it, do not publicly criticize the integrity or intentions of a fellow office holder or staff person. Disagree with ideas, not people. Pre preface statements of disagreement with an acknowledgement of the other person's perspective. And ditto for private statements. They're just as important. He has more. Don't play gotcha with staff. If you have a concern about something, discuss it with someone in advance of any public statements. They make mistakes, so do you. Public statements should consist of a recommended policy changes to fix the problem. And I'll elaborate on this one a little bit. In 20 years of doing this, nothing, I think, makes a city look like the left hand has no idea what the right hand is doing than playing gotcha with staff at a meeting. If you know you've got an issue, do not save it for Monday night. Go to staff and get it worked out because you can stop a lot of angry folks from coming and standing at this very podium and yelling at you about things that if you just had them fixed because you heard about it and you took it to staff and they got it taken care of ahead of time, you know, that stuff doesn't fester. And it, you know, it really changes you know, the approach to the public and, and the elected officials and, and how they perceive staff if, if you know, that's something you do. I'm not saying you guys are doing that. I'm just, we're talking generally here, you know, just as you know, good, you know, good council practice. If you find a problem and want to talk about it publicly, have a solution ready. You'll be asked for one. Learn how to tell constituents you disagree with them. They'll respect you for it. Don't be a wimp. Each vote deserves your independent analysis and vote. Anyone who trades vote doesn't deserve to hold office. Allow measures to be considered on their merits. If you want to pay, play parliamentary procedure games to sabotage a bill, run for higher office, you're way too sophisticated for us. Don't build private alliances with segments of staff. It's destructive. So again, these were just words of wisdom from uh, Mayor Landwehr in, in Jefferson City um, um, and things to think about. So what expectations should there be or are there of elected officials? Again, pretty common sense stuff. Understand the responsibilities of public office. Comply with the law. Practice good behavior. Uh, perform your duties. Participate in your public meetings. Be effective in your communication. Avoid conflicts of interest. Deny gifts, gratuities, and favors. Keep confidential information confidential. Uh, be prudent with your use of public resources. Uh, be careful when you are speaking on behalf of the city or appearing to be speaking on behalf of the city. Respect and adhere to the city charter and create a positive workplace environment. Likewise, what expectation uh, uh, so what, or I'm sorry, what uh, expectations of, of council members uh, should staff members have? Um, they want to see council members who are prepared for uh, meetings by reading all the reports and ordinances on the agenda. Um, and in 20 years of doing this, again, I'm just poking fun at, at other cities that I've worked with, but you know, like I, I, if I was a, uh, if I had a nickel for every time I watched a council member or alderman sit down at a desk and crack open that, that agenda for the very first time when they sat down, I'd be a nickel millionaire, right? I've, I've seen it so many times, you know, but take the time to, to, you know, to take a look at that because they've usually given you the information. The other thing that you can do is if you get your, uh, your packet soon enough and you have the opportunity to look through it, if you have questions, you can ask those questions 
in advance so that staff is ready to answer those. Those are another, it's another circumstance where it looks really like the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing if we wait to ask questions at the meeting that could have been asked ahead of time. Because as we're sitting here at these tables, we don't have the resources you know, available maybe to answer a question that if we had just known a couple hours before, we could say, oh, I can look that up, I'll get that answer to you, you know, and they can answer it there. Wow, that looks really effective as opposed to the, you know, the alternative. Mr. Lauber. Yes. Mr. We, Mayor. We, oh. Mr. Mayor, Mr. Lauber. Go ahead. Mr. Mayor. <laughs> we, just, we just very, very recently uh, approved moving our agenda 10 days before our meeting. And so our agenda with the packet, with all the information, we now have no excuse to not be prepared, but also plenty of time to actually get prepared. So... And my question was, if I could, council member, follow up on that because I had the exact same thought, is what is your typical timeline for the, you know, with all the cities that you work with, their rough agenda deadline? <laughs> and I know there's all kinds of them, but, and I know that's not an easy question to ask, especially off the top of your head, but give me a ballpark. Uh, I'm not going to check the math. I would say 10 days is probably about the longest that we see, um, and, and uh and so, uh, like, I'm the city attorney for Green Valley, Missouri, and they are a solid 10 days out, you know, on all of their, their packets. So there's, there's pros and cons. Obviously, there's sure. plenty of time to look into it. And if you don't have a fast-moving item, you know, those things work great. Gosh darn, this, this microphone and I are going to tangle okay. here. Uh, the, um, the, the downside to it or the con to it is, is it, it makes it harder to move fast, right? right. So if you have an issue that kind of pops up, it, you know, if you're saying it's, you know, like, oh, sorry, 10 days ago, you know, we needed to address that. So, you know, you have to find a good mix. But um, I have a lot of cities that drop their Monday or, or Tuesday packet on Friday, which is probably not enough turnaround, I will be honest with you. Um, so, you know, I would say anywhere from, you know, a week to 10 days is, is, is not bad. And I wouldn't go much less than probably about five days, um, you know, especially if, if two of those are going to be a weekend, uh, for sure. That's just my... Are you talking about five business days or just five total days? Uh, I mean, because five, five business total, days. Five business days is going to be a week. A so, week, I mean, right? that's going to be, yeah. It's, I think you could go maybe a little bit like a Wednesday shorter noon, on that, but yeah. Wednesday yeah. noon for a Monday I meeting. Think, you know, 10 days is, you know, certainly do it. Obviously, you know, you guys made the move, you know, go with it, see what you think of it, you know, and, and does it keep you flexible enough? Because if it keeps you flexible enough, I'd say stick with it because the more time, the better, you know, you can ask the questions. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, proceed. Are you trying to undo our thing? I am not. I was just asking for, you know, making sure that we're reasonable, and he's a professional, and he's got lots of experience, and so I want to gather upon that. Thank you. You're quite welcome, my friend. Let's see here. Uh, whenever possible, call staff with your questions before the meeting so answers can be researched and shared during the meeting. I already covered that, I guess. Uh, examine all all facts on a given issue and make the best decision possible. Do not ridicule or make light of staff in public. Inst instead, provide criticism in private. Criticism should be made through the city manager. So, you know, again, as council members, you know, your point of contact with city staff should be Mr. Walker, not individual staff members. That's important because we're, you know, we'll cover that in a, in a, in a minute on something else. Um, do not assume that staff is wrong and the citizen is right when there's a disagreement. You know, obviously, you know, take your time to understand the facts on both sides because usually, you know, the truth is somewhere in the middle, I always say. Uh, compliment staff when and where appropriate. Um, trust and respect the staff. If you disagree with a staff recommendation, explain your reasoning. Um, don't hold a grudge if you disagree with a staff uh, recommendation and act in a fair, ethical, and consistent manner. So the flip side of that is, what should your expectations be of staff? You should expect your staff to be well organized and anticipate the type and kind of information that you need to perform your duties. I always explain to people, I think, you know, to put it in a nutshell, the responsibility of staff is to make sure that our council has all of the information it needs to make the best decisions possible. And you know, again, we're trying to share that through a staff report, through the, the agenda packets and, and the information that you have to do that. And if you're not feeling like you have the information you need, that's when you should ask you know, to, to have that supplemented. Uh, 
Staff should respond to requests for information in a timely and professional manner. Uh, staff should prepare accurate, well-documented, and well-written reports that where appropriate lay out options for the council to consider. I'm a big, you know, here's the most conservative, here's the, the least conservative, you know, here's somewhere in the middle, and you can feel, you know, and especially when we talk about that, we're talking about your legal risk most of the time, and so, you know, what do you have the stomach for uh, on that? Provide exhibits, illustrations, and or pic staff should provide exhibits, illustrations, and or pictures to help all, uh, sorry, let's just say councilmen, visualize the layout or uh, the location or layout of proposals. They should leave out personal or political bias from their reports. Uh, they should help to orient new members of the council and provide educational opportunities for all members. Uh, they should be accessible to council members, whether in person at, at meetings or over the phone. And I say within the chain of command, though, remember, you know, be careful about interference. That, that's a thing in your, in your charter. Keep all council members equally informed. Do not show favoritism. Uh, make the council's decision work after it's made, and staff should act also in a fair, ethical, and consistent manner. So how, do th how things go wrong and what to do about it. So uh, sometimes we do deal with difficult council members. Uh, council members, you know, may, you know, even, a, and I'll say difficult, you know, maybe I should have put quotation marks in there, because sometimes a council member that is kind of going the, a different direction than, than the, the, you know, most of the council or where the council have been going is because it may be a shifting viewpoint in the community. We are, you know, political, you know, entities. And as viewpoints in the community start to shift, viewpoints on this council will absolutely start to shift. And, and that sometimes you may have, you know, one or two members that, you know, are kind of outliers, if you will. And sometimes I see that shift all the way, you know, to where they're not outliers anymore. Um, difficult council members sometimes have uh, inappropriate expectations of what the role of the council member is. Remember, council works as a group, not as an individual, not even in a group of two or three in your case but it takes four to get anything done. Be careful about campaign promises. You know, if you, if you are out there, you know, stumping and you say you're gonna drain the swamp, it's gonna be really hard to come in and work with some veteran members of, of the, the council and the staff for that matter, I come in. And be careful, <coughs> excuse me, be careful. Keep in mind, all local politics in Missouri are nonpartisan. Okay, when I say local, we're talking about municipal politics are nonpartisan. So be careful not to mix the national issues necessarily with the local issues. You know, make sure you're, you're keeping it at the level that we're operating at. Can I ask be you a question on that? Yes, sir. Uh, quick question. So if someone does do that, is there any state laws to prohibit them from doing that or any penalties for that, that kind of thing? There really aren't because, I, I mean, within our structure, there still is not partisan politics. I mean, in... in you know, just my observation, obviously, in the last five, ten, you know, ten years for sure, uh, there, our national politics have become more and more polarized all the time, it seems. And sometimes it's very hard for people to kind of leave that, you know, behind. But uh, because the system is set up so that you don't have a, an R or a D or an I or, or whatever, you know, next to your name when you get elected, it, you know, the structure right now is to keep that out. And, I mean, to the extent that you're going to have it, it's going to be on personal belief. So... You don't check your, you know, First Amendment rights at the door when you get elected. So, thank you. Uh, sometimes uh, council, difficult council members, you know, uh, can come uh, from the urge to fix things. You know, kind of you know, again keeping you know, that, my, that the, in mind that that person with the arm up the pipe. Um, failure to understand the council manager relationship uh, can can lead to uh, uh, difficult uh, uh, relationships, and sometimes um, fear leads to difficult relationships. That you know, if you vote no, you might be less likely to be uh, criticized by your constituents, or you know, you worry too much about like what other people kind of think about you. You know, you were elected to to carry out what it is that your constituents want, but in the end, like, they were you know, they want to hear, you know, your viewpoints because, you know, they, they, they put you in this office, you know, to, to, to carry that out. So what are some uh, characteristics of difficult council members? And I've added the picture of Jeff, Jeff Foxworthy here because this ends up being, you know, one of those that kind of seems like you might be a redneck if, you, know, you might be a difficult council member if uh, you interfere with employees, uh, you're, you demand special access, uh, you treat each staff presentation as an inquisition, you might be a difficult council member. Uh, 
routinely disclose confidential information to the media, uh, spend all of your time on, min on minutia and miss the big picture completely. Um, if you're not prepared for meetings and you regularly ask questions that were answered in council meetings or the council packet, I've had presentations where I've literally just said the words and the next question is, well, what is this? <coughs> wow, were you sleeping or what? You know, so be careful uh, with that. So can I ask you, Mr. Lauber, what's the most <coughs> irritating thing that people do to you? I'm <laughs> right. just kidding. Just did it for, for No, that wasn't, that wasn't even the most irritating. No, I'm just kidding. Hand up the pipe is, is a close second, I guess. Uh, if you're not willing to bring closure and always want more information before voting, uh, you know, that, that can be uh, problematic. If you refuse to abide by the meeting rules of order, uh, I have, you know, that in some of my communities. Uh, if you circumvent the manager and you go straight to internal staff, uh, including the manager's assistants, that's going to be problematic. Uh, and if you try to make uh, the staff and the city manager or a fellow elected officials look bad, these are all things that, you know, you might be a difficult council member. So if we've got a difficult council member, how do you deal with them? Well, one of the things you need to do is, is exercise emotional maturity and intelligence. Stay professional, stay on the high road, make it appear, uh, do, uh, and do not make it appear that you've made it personal. Uh, hold firm to required positions, but do it in a way that does not uh, communicate personal animosity. And I've had, I've had council members that you know, we've censured, and I had, a, I had a guy one time that hated the mayor so much that every time there was a proclamation that the mayor would read, this alderman in this case would say, for the record, mayor, I want to uh, let everybody know that I, uh, I approve of the, the subject matter of this, but I disapprove of the person speaking it. And every time the mayor would read a proclamation, this alderman would get up and walk out of the room until the mayor was done, and then would come back in and sit down. It was actually fun. We censured him on his last meeting, and then he resigned, so. Um, it's, it's problematic. Uh, keep communication open. Uh, it won't be helpful to shut down communication with the individual, even though they may choose to. So, you know, keep, keep the person engaged, uh, to kind of, you know, to work through the problems. Keep things in perspective. Insulate your staff from negative com conduct to the greatest extent possible. Um, the same alderman used to, you know, uh, get angry at city staff, very angry at city staff every year on Memorial Day because no one came up to City Hall at noon on Monday to raise the flags back up to full staff because that's the national flag code says that you only keep your flags to half staff until noon on Memorial Day and that was his thing. I don't know why. That's what he picked on. Help the uh, uh, council and staff stay focused on the work of the or organization and accept that the best you may be able to do is minimize the negative consequences of that outlier's conduct. Um, use procedural rules to control meetings. Um, uh, so again, you know, as the presiding officer of the meeting, you know, there are procedural rules in place and it's designed to keep decorum. It's designed to keep, you know, the flow of the meeting going. Um, so, and, you know, I've, I've seen it practice here this evening, you know, be careful, you know, not to allow council members to speak unless recognized. Don't allow the public to interrupt. I think a lot of uh, con uh, constituents, a lot of citizens don't realize that, you know, public meeting means open for public observation. It does not mean public participation. Or the only time that public participation is actually, you know, uh, permitted is either if there's a required public hearing or if you open your meeting up to public comments for a certain piece of it. Otherwise, you know, public meetings are just for observation uh, to allow that. And I've, I've seen some, you know, really egregious uh, meetings uh, where that got out of control. Uh, make sure you make your motion before you have your discussion. Uh, you know, cause sometimes the motion doesn't even, you know, get to that point. Um, roll call votes do force commitment. So keep that in mind. You should always stick to your agenda. Items that are not on the agenda should be taken up at another meeting or you should vote to add to the agenda. Um, and council comments should be comments, not motions. So these are kind of the really bad things. Uh, so if you have, you know, so there are certain situations that require, a th you know, action. So if you have sexual harassment, uh, call the city attorney, follow your personnel policies. If you have criminal activity, um, call the police. If you have ethical uh, issues, contact the Ethics Commission and be aware that nepotism, uh, which is when you hire someone within the fourth degree of consanguinity or affinity, if you commit nepotism in the state of Missouri, you are immediately ejected from office. There is no appeal. Uh, there's no saving it. You are gone. 
Mr. So. Mayor. Proceed. Uh, what, what's the fourth degree of concept? What'd you say consanguinity? So the consanguinity or affinity. Yeah. Consanguinity is a blood relation. Affinity is a marriage relation. Uh, so, and I represent some, some cities that are less than 200 in population. I mean, that describes the whole town right there, but you have to be careful, you know, um, to, to ensure that when you, when you are voting to retain someone in their position, or if you're voting to, to hire somebody, or if you're voting even to appoint someone to like a planning commission, board of uh, adjustment, things like that, be aware that if you have a relative that is on that, um, and, and I, I apologize, I can't think off the top of my head what the fourth degree, my other slides actually would have covered this before, but when you have that, you know, you need to recuse yourself. That's a true conflict of interest where you should recuse yourself. So, um, so what do you do uh, when, you have, when you have these folks? You know, one of the things you can do is intervene, and so there are various levels of inter intervention um, that, that can be done. Obviously, if you have, you know, somebody who's being problematic, you know, start by just talking with them, right? Whether you do it, you know, council member to council member, or maybe, you know, you know, ultimately, you know, you do something a little bit bigger, you know, from a, you know, where you actually have a council meeting to do that. Um, you know, start with a personal intervention. Sometimes you can solicit help from others, in, including a, f a facilitator. I, there was a client that I had one time that I wasn't the city attorney, but I was brought in to kind of do kind of, I guess, a kumbaya session, if nothing else. They were having a really difficult time operating as a board because they were so, I mean, they were very, you know, divided and very, you know, polarized. And, you know, they brought me in to kind of help them, you know, build some uh, uh, consensus. <clears throat> you can have formal, formal and outside intervention. Sometimes it's a formal complaint and investigation, and sometimes it leads to, to censure. Um, censure requires a, a majority vote of the council, and it can be public or private, but it is subject to the Sunshine Law. We are not, council members are not employees. You don't have personnel issues. Um, so there aren't closed sessions to discuss problematic council members. That stuff has to be done in, in public, and that's why I always suggest speak in less than a quorum to begin with. You know, try to have a one-on-one -on -one or you know a personal intervention that is less than a council or less than the quorum of a council, so that you know that is not going to be subject to at least Sunshine Law notice of the meeting and agenda and so forth. Um, when it gets really bad, impeachment is is in the cards, and the, the picture that you see at the bottom left-hand corner is actually an impeachment that our firm is is. Uh, Currently, we're on appeal in the Eighth Circuit uh, Court of Appeals. On this is uh, uh, the the lady uh, in the picture is is Councilman uh, former Council Member Katie Gatewood of O'Fallon, Missouri, and that's her attorney in the picture. And and uh, Ms. Gatewood uh, was uh, ultimately convicted about a year ago of of committing uh, interference, uh, which was actually covered in two p places in the O'Fallon Charter and two places separately, so four total places in the ordinances and charter of the city of O'Fallon. Um, the council voted to hold an impeachment hearing. Uh, there was actually evidence presented uh, both sides, and the council uh, voted uh, to remove Ms. Gatewood from office, and you know, uh, that, was, that was done immediately, and essentially you know, right now uh, they, they had filed uh, for a, a stay uh, of the proceedings in federal court, um, and uh, that was, uh, the federal court abstained from from getting involved, and now it's on appeal in the Eighth Circuit. But it it, it can be it can be a real mess. Uh, but this is one of those situations where it got so bad that the other council members said we got to put an end to it, and and they did uh, in that circumstance. So to end on a good note, what are some uh, good what what do good councils do? So uh, good councils have good meetings. They are smooth and productive. Uh, the staff lets, uh, let, should let the council know when controversial issues are coming up so you can kind of smooth out some of those peaks and valleys. Uh, uh, we should give enough information to make uh, an informed decision, but, but not so much information that, um, that staff is inviting you to micromanage. Um, staff should do the math, calculate out totals, bid tables, and show uh, salary ranges. We talked about it before follow the agenda, and follow good procedure. You know, I always say, you know, if you keep your procedure strong during good times, you'll be thankful for it in bad times because you don't want to be changing your council rules of procedure. You don't want to be changing your rules of, of public engagement 
you know, when a tough issue comes up, because then people will say, you're doing this because of what I want to say, not, you know, that I want to say it. Um, when you follow good procedure, it makes minutes easier, and staff can always uh, gently assist with, you know, getting uh, the correct procedure put down. So um, something that's important is, you know, in order to help our city councils stay in the, in the policy making and less, you know, with their arm up the pipe, um, staff should not invite them to micromanage. So if the public says we need a place and the council gets together and says, yeah, we do, do it, when it goes to staff, staff shouldn't be coming back to you all and asking the details that they should be providing themselves, okay? They should not be inviting you to micromanage them. If you've given the direction, they need to get out there and get the job done. And so, um, you know, you see some examples of, you know, of, of very, you know, day-to-day -day, uh, operations for decision-making on, you know, some sort of a, of a project like that. Uh, council member decorum, always be polite, show respect to other council members, staff, and the audience. Uh, always address the chair, uh, which is the mayor, and use titles uh, or last names. Uh, you know, Mr. Mayor, I'll be, you know, voting for, uh, you know, Ms. Long's bill. Uh, turn on your mic when you speak, turn it off when you're done. Speak so the audience can hear and avoid co side conversations. Pay attention to the speaker and stop looking at your phone. And, and first and foremost, I don't know how many times I've sat in a meeting and I can actually see somebody over here, and then I see somebody down here laugh. And you're like, oh, oh, oh <laughs> that's not good. Because you can actually have two meetings at one time, okay? You can have the physical meeting that everybody's there and the public has a right to observe, right? We talked about that earlier. But if you're holding another meeting where you are communicating with a quorum of you, you're actually holding a second meeting illegally under the Sunshine Law where you did not notice, you did not give the public the opportunity to uh, attend the meeting, and um, you may be you know, creating a Sunshine Law violation uh, for yourself. <clears throat> so do not do that. You know, keep that phone down um, you know, and, and don't be communicating with, the, with each other to, you know, that would cause people to, uh, to maybe have some questions. Mr. Mayor. Please proceed. Mr. Lauber, sorry about that. Yes, sir. I'm stretching this out for everybody and I apologize. <clears throat> do you have councils that have no phone rules? Um, or ha ha what, what, what would you say is a best practice on that? I'm guilty of it's it not, myself completely. I it's just. It's not a horrible idea. I don't know. I mean, it's difficult. You know, we live in a world where, you know, the phone's there. I mean, sometimes you need to know what time it is. Sometimes you need to know if, if your kid's in a ditch someplace. And so you know, I would have a hard time with a no phone rule, but I think they should certainly have a, you know, no, no texting during meetings rule. But, I mean, maybe that's just common sense, but uh, something like that. So it's hard I, to be, it's, yeah. it is hard to be disciplined sometimes. Yeah. Even if it's not, me. I mean, it's not, doesn't have to be meeting related. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I think it's, it would be up to each individual council to decide that for themselves. You know, I see pros and cons with it. You know, again, um, you know, you're here late at night sometimes and, you know, communications, you got to know whether you got to pick up milk on the way home. So, um, we are going to be in trouble. Gotcha. So, um, that's actually my last slide. So I'm happy to answer any further questions. I hope you found it beneficial and Good information. Just one quick question. We don't, and not that I have any intent of doing this to any of my colleagues, <laughs> uh, but in our charter, we don't have, as, as far as I understand, no provision for impeachment if removing council members from the body. I, I don't think we do. Didn't specifically look at that, and I probably should have. No, no, no. I don't. I'm not trying it, to. But, yeah. But my question is, and we may. If I can, rather than take everybody's time on it, I'd like to talk offline with you and say, okay, sure. what are some other procedures that other organizations do so that we can do best practices? But um, just one unique thing for our charter that there's there's no way to remove, uh, when you talk about the impeachment earlier, there's no way for us to do that if somebody misbehaves. And not that anyone is and everybody's being, right, right. Uh, you know, very professional, but just a concern if somebody did go, you know, out of their lane. Yeah, um, I think that may be true. I know, if, if I remember correctly, I think you have initiative and referendum, which is, you know, from you can the recall public's them, right. perspective, um, but, and, and recall, um, but I, uh, I, I, I don't know, so we could certainly have that or have yeah. that conversation anyway. with Mr. Cove. All right, I've taken this off, off track, and I'll ask some other questions. I've got some other questions for you, but we can ask offline on that one, so. Sure. 
Anyone else before we wrap up? With that being said, we'll call the meeting adjourned. Oh, sorry. Okay, excuse me, please forgive me. I do have board reports, so thank you. No problem. Uh, board of Adjustment, we're looking to add a resolution to appoint Anthony Summer and Cody Atkinson. Um, if there's no objections, this item is already on the November 21st agenda. If there are objections to adding them, then we'll just have to remove that resolution. That's all I have. Thank you. That's it. Good to adjourn. All right. With that, we'll adjourn. Thank you all.